so glad that you're with us today. We're continuing the series that we've been in for several weeks called Unshakable. And we've been talking about how there are times in our life that really the ground shakes underneath us and moments come that shake us to our core and that it's going to shake our family, it's going to shake our marriage. And we need to learn to be unshakable in those moments. God wants us to be unshakable. And so tonight I want to share with you how can we remain unshakable when we're under attack? How do we remain unshakable when we're under attack? Now, how many of you have had a bad day at some point? Ladies, moms, and here we know it does not take very long to have a bad day in our household. All it takes is for the kids to wake up on the wrong side of the bed, and then it's everything within us to get them to school in one piece. And then we go and we get all of the traffic on 1604. It like waited for us to get on the highway. We have horrible days at work. And then when we get home, all of our plans as far as having the perfect meal with our family fall apart. The kids have all these unexpected assignments that they really knew about but didn't tell us about that they have to get done. And at the end of the day, all we're praying is, God, I pray tomorrow is nothing like today. And we always know we have the hope that tomorrow can be better. But there are times in life where a bad day turns into a bad week. And then that bad week becomes a bad month. And then before we know it, we're in this season and in this time that no matter what we do, no matter how hard we try, we can't overcome it, we can't make it better, we can't improve it. And in those times, we are under attack. We're under attack. See, an attack is when Satan uses circumstances, people, interruptions, temptations, distractions in our life to derail us from our spiritual advancement towards him. And so at some point in your life, you're going to face an attack. And so the question becomes, how do we remain unshakable when we're under attack? See, I believe the Bible gives us a roadmap on how to do this. There are stories, countless stories in the Bible over and over again of people who, sh who shook underneath them. The ground shook. The circumstances were difficult. They faced a storm. They faced a trial in a circumstance that seemed beyond what they could do. But God showed up and God walked them through that circumstance. And so I want to look at a chapter in the Bible that talks about these people. So turn to Hebrews 11. You can open up your Westover app or open up your Bible app. That's where we're going to be today. And for those that know anything about Hebrews, you immediately know Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. Because the author in Hebrews, he begins to recount in, in chapter 11 story after story of people in the Bible who we would call pillars of faith. And so today I want to look at one story and one person in particular that we typically look at as this great man of faith, and that's Moses. See, in our mind and in our hearts, we think of Moses as this great man that led the people out of Egypt. But really, if you look at the story of Moses, time after time after time, he dealt with attacks in his life, literally from the time that he was born. But somehow he ended up in the faith chapter. And so we want to look at tonight, how did he remain unshakable when those moments came? So join me in Hebrews 11. We're going to start in verse 24. And it says, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But what the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. And we see throughout these, these passages and these verses all of the obstacles that Moses faced. Throughout his life, he constantly faced opposition in trying to do God's will. 
really from the time that he was born, he was under attack. See, Moses was born during a time where the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And the Pharaoh had become concerned about how many Israelites there were. And he was afraid they were going to rise up and revolt. So he ordered the mass execution of all the Israelite males under the age of two. And that's when Moses was born. And so Moses' mother, when she saw him when he was born, she knew God had a plan for his life. And so she tried to save him because she knew he was under attack. And we know the story. She puts him in a basket, and she takes him into the Nile River, hoping that he'll be saved. And so Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses, takes him in, raises him in the palace, and he grows up with all the wealth and the privilege of anybody in the palace of Pharaoh. But we know the story that as he grew, he discovered his true identity. And he instead decided to give up all the pleasures, all the wealth, all the privilege that had been afforded to him and serve as a slave with his people. And then the story goes on and the moment comes where he's under attack again as a slave and he has to flee Egypt and he ends up hiding in the desert for several years. And God calls him out of the desert and says, go and free my people in Egypt. So Moses obeys and he goes back to Egypt. He goes to Pharaoh, the man he rejected and walked away from his household and said, God said to let his people go. And over the course of 10 plagues that we know about, Pharaoh eventually lets the people go and Moses leads them out of Egypt and leads them into the promised land that God had promised them years before. And as they're coming out of Egypt, there's over a million Israelites with him that he has to lead. And they get up to the Red Sea, which was this boundary that they had to cross to get out of Egypt and into the promised land. And he's looking at the situation and it seems like it's something that you can't overcome. And then all of a sudden, he hears the chariots, and he hears the armies of Egypt after him. And he's faced between two obstacles. And by faith, again, he believes that God's going to take them through. God opens and parts the Red Sea. The people cross over, and the Egyptians are drowned. And we think of all of these things, and we think of how God moved. But all of those moments, Moses was under attack. All of those times, he struggled. But what took him through? His faith. His faith is what took him to the other side. His faith in God and believing that he could do something about the situation and that he would walk him through kept Moses throughout his journey. And so today I want to share with you three thoughts on what faith does in our life when we're under attack. The first thing that faith does is it sharpens our focus. It sharpens our focus Verse 27 says, he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. See, faith sharpens our focus. The author of Hebrews 11, at the very beginning of the chapter, defines faith as the confidence in which we hope for and assurance for what we do not see. See, Moses experienced difficulty and opposition his entire life. This, these verses recount time after time, opposition after opposition of what he faced. But all through that time, what it also says is that he had faith. And what was so important about his faith and what the scriptures clearly say is that he persevered. He persevered. His faith had perseverance to it. He didn't focus on the issues around him, but instead he kept his focus on God. Our focus determines our future. Whatever we focus on determines our future. And it's hard sometimes when we're in the middle of the struggle, when we're in the middle of the storm, to see anything beyond what's right in front of us. All we can see is the chaos, the problem at work, the tension in the marriage, maybe the financial lack that we're experiencing. And we stay in that place and we just see what's happening around us. Whatever we focus on gets our attention. And we have a tendency that when challenges come in our life, that we want an immediate solution. We want immediate resolution. Ladies, if you're anything like me, most of us, we don't like for our households to be upset. We don't want there to be chaos. We don't want there to be instability. So anytime that happens, we go into solution mode. 
What can I do to solve it now? Okay, if there's a problem with my kids, there's a problem in the house, there's a problem with this or at work, we begin to make task lists. Let's see how we can fix this, how we can solve this. But when we focus only on getting the solution, we don't end up focusing on God and his role in the situation. Our focus is on the issue and not on God. And somehow we neglect or we forget to put our faith in God until after we've exhausted all of our own resources. After we've tried it our own way, after we've gone and tried to solve it our own way, then we cry out to God and our prayer becomes, God, I tried, I did it my way, it didn't work, come save me now. I need you now. Has God ever seemed silent in the middle of your storm? You just felt like you couldn't hear him. See, when our focus is on Jesus, despite the storm around us, we begin to see his hand working in our situation. Faith allows us to see his hand at work. Faith is spiritual foresight. It reveals the invisible. It reveals the things we cannot see. Hindsight reveals God's visible hand. But foresight reveals God's invisible plan. And those are two different things. See, hindsight is when God has already taken us through the situation. He's already got us to the other side. And we look back and we say, God, I see what you did here. I see how you protected me. I see how you navigated things. I see how you closed doors and you opened doors. And I understand now what you were doing then. That's hindsight. But foresight is the faith to say, I'm in the middle of the situation. I don't know what's happening. The storm is raging around me. The, the ground is shaking underneath me, God. But I know, and my faith says, you know what's going on. I know that no matter what's happening, I know you have a plan. And I see your invisible hand and plan working all over this when nobody else does. Faith sharpens our focus. The second thing that faith does is it changes our perspective. Verse 26 says, He re regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. See, Moses grew up with all the wealth and the privilege and the power that could be afforded to anybody. He lived in Pharaoh's palace and he really could have had whatever he wanted. But he chose to give it all up and serve as a slave with his people. And from the outside looking in, that doesn't seem like the most obvious choice. And we wonder, and it doesn't seem to make sense. But Moses saw beyond the circumstance. Moses saw a greater reward. And so he rejected all of the treasures and all of the things he could have had for God's future and for God's reward. Moses had a long-term perspective instead of focusing on short-term pleasure. I've learned that a no to the world empowers a yes to God. When I say no to the world and to the temporary relief and to the temporary satisfaction of my situation and instead say yes to God and what you have for me and your plan for my life and where you want to take me, I know that there's a greater reward on the other side. Moses said no to the world to say yes to God. He had a long-term perspective, and he was willing to experience the discomfort and the disgrace in the short term, term to qualify for God's long-term reward. See, when we're under attack, we need a long-term perspective. We need to remember that the pain and the struggle that we're currently in is not permanent. And for somebody here today, I want you to know where you're at is not permanent. God is never intending for you to stay there. There is relief and there is a future on the other side of your pain that he's going to take you through. It's not permanent. But see, there's this principle in life that we understand but we don't quite apply it to our spiritual life. And that's the principle of delayed gratification. We understand it in life, it makes sense, but we have a hard time applying it to our spiritual walk. See, delayed gratification says that you are let go of what you want now 
so that you can hold on to what you want most. I discovered the concept and the principle of delayed gratification very early on in life. I was about seven or eight, and I was at the store with my dad, and I saw this necklace that I really wanted. And I remember it was $24, and that might as well have been $100 in my economy. And, but I wanted it so bad, so I went to my dad and I said, Dad, can you please buy me this necklace? And my dad, being the man that he is, saw this as a great opportunity to teach me the power of a dollar and the concept of delayed gratification. And so he said, Danae, I'll buy you the necklace, but here's the deal. You don't get the necklace until you have worked off and earned enough money to pay me back. And so that made sense to me, and I said, sure, absolutely, no problem. So I agreed. So then my next question was, what can I do to earn money in order to to be able to pay for this necklace? And so we began to brainstorm on some options that I could have to do. And you see, my dad never had sons. And so being the firstborn as a daughter, I sometimes got the privilege of having these son duties that I had to step into because he didn't have um, any sons in his life. And so he thought, you know what? You can mow the lawn. And I'm seven. I have no idea. And I said, sure, I can mow the lawn. Like, this is easy. And so I said, sure. And I agreed. So my next question was, how much are you going to pay me to mow the lawn? And my dad thought about it for a second, and he said, you know what? I'll pay you a dollar to mow the front lawn and a dollar to mow the back lawn. (laughs) This happened, guys. And so when you mow all the lawn, you get $2. And I had no idea, but I agreed, and I said, sure, absolutely. Now, even accounting for inflation, he was getting a deal, can I just say. And so I did the math. That meant 12 mows. So I agreed, and I started down this process. And weeks had gone by, and weeks had gone by, and I was mowing consistently. And so one day we're in the car, and we're driving. My dad's in the front seat driving. My mom's there, and I'm in the back seat doing mental math and saying, okay, I've mowed the lawn this many times. I've earned this much money. I have to mow this many more times. And so I chime up and I tell my dad, dad, I think I have to mow the lawn this many more times, and then I get my necklace. And he said, yes, you're doing a great job, Danae. Keep it up. And then my mom, she sat there, and I think it's like the wheels started turning because she knew how many times I had mowed the lawn. And it's like God-inspired discernment came upon her in that moment. And she asked this very important question to my dad. And she said, how much are you paying her to mow the lawn? And my dad said, a dollar for the front and a dollar for the back. And it's like righteous anger came up inside of her. And all of a sudden, this motherly intuition came up. And she said, a dollar? She's worth more than that. You need to pay her more. That's not fair. And I'm sitting in the back seat, and I'm watching this interchange happen. And even though I was young, I saw this was an opportunity in my life. And so I chimed up real quickly, and I said, yeah, Dad, you need to be paying me more than that. I deserve more. This is not fair. So I get on this bandwagon. And so my mom begins to negotiate a rate for me. And after much negotiation, she lands on a rate that is acceptable to everybody. And then it's like God-inspired decision came in that moment as well. And she decided to make the deal retroactive. So she took my rate and took it to the very beginning of when this whole thing started. And in that moment, I went from owing my dad to he gave me the necklace immediately and he still owed me money. (laughs) Yes. It was a great moment in my life. It was a great moment. But you see, at the very beginning, when I struck that deal, I understood and realized that the reward on the other side was worth all the work to get there. And I think we're like that sometimes. We're in the middle of the situation, and at the, at the very beginning, we're like, yes, God, it's worth it. That's where I want to go. That's where I want to be. You're going you're gonna to take me there. But then we get in the middle of the situation and we get in the middle of the struggle and the tension and the pressure mounts and we said, I'm done, God, no more. 
I don't want any more of this. And that's when he comes in and he says, no, I have more for you. I have more for you. See, God is asking us to say no to some things. So what is he asking for you to say no to right now? We struggle with delayed gratification. Young dating couples, keep the relationship pure until marriage. The reward on the other side is worth all of the discomfort you think you're experiencing right now. Professionals, keep your integrity at work, even when it feels like it's not being rewarded. And parents, maintain a biblical standard in your household and with your kids, even when they don't agree and even when they don't like you. You need to keep a long-term perspective. Temporary pleasures compromise eternal purpose. And so we must keep an internal perspective to the temporary pain we are experiencing. And Moses understood this. He saw that there was a reward on the other side. See, God's no right now means I have something better for you later. Embrace God's no for a greater yes. And the last thing that faith does when we're under attack is it qualifies us for God's protection. It says in verse 28, By faith he kept the Passover and the application of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. See, in these verses, the author builds a case for Moses' faith. Because in both situations, it seemed like certain death and impossible situations to, to get past. Whether it was in the middle of that 10th plague when God told, um, God told Moses, I'm going to bring a plague and I'm going to kill all of the firstborn of Egypt. But God's protection, if it's over your household, will save you. The verse says, and by faith Moses obeyed. And then he lets them out of Egypt and they get to the Red Sea and they're about to cross. And all of a sudden an impossible barrier is in front of them and he hears the Egyptians coming, and he hears the chariots, and he hears the armies, and he's stuck between two places, and he's under attack, and he doesn't know what to do yet next, but the verse says, and by faith, Moses obeyed, and he stepped out in faith, God made a way, and he saved the people. What seemed like impossible situations through faith became opportunities for God to show up. When we're under attack, our natural tendency is either flight or fight. Psychologists and counselors will tell you this, that when we feel threatened, when we feel under attack, when we feel like things are not going our way and we're uncomfortable with the situation, we're either going to run away or we're going to fight our way through it. But you see, our human nature will always fail us. God's plan is different and God's plan is better. When we're under attack, faith steps in. By faith, we don't run, we stand. You don't run from the situation, you stand in faith. And by faith, we don't fight, God fights for us. We don't have to turn away, we don't run away, we stand there and say, God, I trust you in this moment, no matter what's going to happen, you're in control, and you will fight my battle. And I see that on the other side of this, you have a future, and you have a purpose, and I don't understand all of it, but I'm not turning away. I'm standing in faith. See, Ephesians 6.16 6, says, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. See, faith is a shield for our soul. It protects us in those moments, and it rises up within us because we are all going to be under attack. No one is exempt. And you might be saying, well, I don't think I'm under attack right now. Everything's going fine. That's great, but there's going to become a time when you will because no one is exempt. Several years ago, my husband, Jonathan, and I were really going through a very difficult time in our life. He was a counselor at another job here in, in another organization here in San Antonio. And over the course of time, it had become very difficult. 
almost a very hostile environment at work and just a lot of issues that he were, were coming up and just it seemed like no matter what he did, nothing got better. And all the while that was happening, God was really dealing in our hearts and beginning to stir something in our heart. And he was speaking to us and saying, I'm about to shift you. I'm about to move you. Things are going to change. And we didn't know what that meant. And we didn't know what God was doing, but it created a lot of uncertainty in our life. And so we were seeking God and saying, God, what do you have for us? What are you trying to do? And But we felt like we didn't have clear answers yet. And all the while we're dealing with trying to find God's will, the situation at work just got worse and worse. And no matter what my husband did, it never got better. And month after month after month went by, and we just sat in this season. And then one day, we were sitting together talking, and we were walking through what was going on in our life. And I remember clearly in that moment, we said, enough is enough. Enough is enough. We're not staying here anymore. We're not staying here anymore. We were under attack. And so our prayer began to be, God, if you don't take us out of this situation, if you don't remove this situation, if you can't change what's happening around us, then grow within us. Grow within me. And all of a sudden, faith arose. All of a sudden, faith rose up out of nowhere. And God became bigger than the circumstance, became bigger than the problem. God stepped in. And I'd love to tell you that in that moment, from that time, that immediately our circumstance changed. But it didn't. We went through months after that, still dealing with the turmoil that was occurring in our lives. But I can tell you from that moment on, although the circumstance didn't change, we changed in the circumstance. Because faith arose. Faith came up. And we decided that God was bigger than the problem. And God was bigger than the work. And God was bigger than the uncertainty and the the lack of knowing what was happening in the future. We knew God was in the middle of it. See, faith always grows in the fire. So today, you might be in a place where you're feeling under attack. And you're saying, I can't take it anymore. When is relief going to come? Maybe it's a combative work environment. And every day you walk into that job, and when you walk through the doors, you feel like this weight comes upon you. And all the while you're there, you feel like you're fighting a battle. And you're praying, God, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired. I don't want to be the light anymore in here. Take me out of this situation. Or maybe it's your marriage, and you're in a deadlock. And no matter what you do, you guys want to make it better. You want to improve your marriage. You want things to be better. But you feel like you can't hit that breakthrough and you've stayed there. Or maybe you're burdened for your kids because you know every day when they walk through the doors of their school, they're facing a clash of culture like they've never felt before and the headwind is stronger than they are. And there's a burden that's inside of you. I want to challenge you today don't run, don't fight, stand in faith. Stand in faith because faith brings peace into our situation. The Holy Spirit comes in and he calms the storm in our heart and he calms the storm around us. He brings peace and protection and assurance. And see, God might not be able to change the circumstance right now, but faith can change you in the circumstance. Stand in faith. When faith stands up, God steps in. When faith arises in who we are and in our circumstance, God steps in and he becomes bigger than the storm and he becomes bigger than the challenge and he will walk you through your season. He will walk you through your storm. So as we close, I want to invite everybody to stand and just put everything aside for a moment. And I don't know where you're at right now, 
But I know some of you have walked in this place and you're saying, I'm under attack. I'm in the storm and I can't take it anymore. And I believe God wants to speak to you tonight and he wants to speak to your heart and he wants to bring peace. And so I want to give him a moment to speak. So I would ask for every head to be bowed, every eye to close. I don't know what the storm is. I don't know what the struggle is, but God knows. And if you're under attack and you need faith to rise up in your situation, I want you to raise your hand. And by raising your hand, you're saying, God, I've tried it on my own. I've done it on my own. I'm tired of fighting. I'm not going to run. And I'm standing in faith today because I know you have something for me and you're going to walk me through it. And with every hand that's raised, I want to pray a prayer of faith over you that when you walk out of the auditorium and you walk out these doors, that you walk out in faith into the storm that you're facing. And although the situation might change, might not change, you will change in it. Stand in faith because when faith stands up, God steps in. Let's pray. God, I thank you for every person that is here. Lord, you know the circumstances, you know the problems, you know the challenges that they are facing when they walk out this door. God, and I pray that right now you would begin to meet them at the point of their need. Lord, that you would begin to rise up faith inside of their heart that will take them beyond the challenge. Let them see your invisible hand working in their situation. God, I pray that you would arise faith in people's lives that as they walk out today and they exit out these doors, God, that they would walk in a new faith in you. God, the situation might not change, but we are going to change in this situation. And we stand in faith because we know you are a God that is faithful. And we thank you for what you're going to do. And I thank you in advance for what you're going to do in these situations and the breakthroughs that are going to happen tonight. We give you all the praise because you deserve it. Lord, and we're going to stand in faith today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. God bless you. We are dismissed.